quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. It's viewpoint. Program of personalities, <laughs> politicians, and perspectives. Well, we sure got a couple here today. They're perspectives and personalities. We're going to have politicians uh, uh, later on here. A couple of very nice gentlemen uh, vying for the uh, job of sheriff of Logan County. And we'll have them in the next couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll stay uh, clear of politics, except I have some th things to talk about politics. But, but anyway, uh, oh. Hi. Kudos. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> this is my partner, Judy Busby, over here, also our neighbor. Uh, and my wife, dear friend. What was it Jean said? Anyway, no, we'll skip oh, that. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we'll skip that part anyway. <laughs> Family show is what that it is. That sleeping now. dog's lie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't even kick him. Uh, kudos. You know, many years ago, well, not many, but several years ago, uh, the late John Welsh started an invitational basketball tourney in Lincoln, and it's now become the John Welsh tourney uh, in honor of uh, John. And uh, I, I haven't been going to them because they're younger kids and I don't know any of them, but uh, my young grandson came down from Canton with a group. So Bill started going to basketball games this last weekend, went to three of them. Kids won two out of three, which is not bad. But the point is, not who wins and who loses, uh, somebody, bodies, go to an awful lot of work. There were over 100 teams Ufta. come in here to Lincoln. And uh, let me tell you, that leaves some cash in the community, too, from an economic standpoint. I had a restaurant there tell me that uh, um, that's one of the two big weekends of the year for them. I didn't realize it was that big. The other one being the soccer weekend, uh -huh. by any chance? Didn't you didn't get it. what was second place, huh? No. Jeez, we get the whole that. story before you yeah. know. <laughs> See, that's all I get is criticism up here, Thomas. You know, <laughs> But hey, seriously, uh, we like to have a little fun up here, too. Um, I was very impressed with, number one, uh, the fact that there were over 100, 114, I'm told, and uh, it was well oiled. They had they used every gym in, in the community. Uh, I don't think they used the orphans' home gym. Uh, boy, that dated me. Use that term. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but all the schools, uh, gyms were all used, and uh, it seemed to be well organized. Uh, the kids, if they won this one or won that one or won the next one, they knew where they were going to go to the next gym and at what time. It was really smooth to be done, and so hats off to these folks. Where were we? Oh, right here in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I want to make sure. Cold, you know. Cold again. Did you notice that? Well, yeah, but I have a factoid to share with you, and I have the whole story, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, okay. What up? Now, for, for those of you who woke up yesterday morning and looked out your window and said, oh, not again. It's just so you know that we are not alone, okay? This snowfall this year in Duluth, Minnesota, Minnesota's north of here, <laughs> uh, 82.4 inches. Good okay? heavens. Uh, New York, 52.1. Uh, Detroit, 78 flat. Now, we're talking real snow here pretty much, you know? 52 in Indianapolis, 53 in Moline, Illinois, Minneapolis, St. Paul, 56-1. So, uh, don't th you know, it says in the Bible that the rain falls equally on the just and unjust. Well, <laughs> the snow is pretty equal, too. She's a many-faceted girl. She <laughs> knows, quote the Bible, and uh, uh, also... Uh, read factoids. Yes, right, read factoids. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to get on to serious business here. Yes. Um, in just a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this being the political That was just for you <laughs> listeners. <laughs> you know it is coming, okay? In case just you have noticed. Just be patient. Just in case you have noticed. <laughs> this is a political season. We'll be a little more uh, more hotly uh, contested uh, very shortly here at the primary level. And then we go through in November. I think we'll, you know, we'll survive that. But uh, a noted bard said... If, uh, let's see, the problem with political jokes is they get elected. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was pretty well said. Oh. 
Now, let's get down to serious business. Why don't you introduce our guest and his daughter? Yeah, really this needs is, to have that with this is gonna This is going to be very interesting. Bill Thomas and his daughter, Rachel Nicer. I thought it was just nicer, and you are nicer. Not nicer than Bill, necessarily, <laughs> but... <laughs> Certainly nicer than me. Well, she's got golf well, for good genes, nice. I'll tell you that. Now, she's the program director for the uh, library and the museum here in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And so her dad likes her very much because she's a success and supporting herself. Yes, she's doing She's doing very well. Uh, she writes her own rent check, so I'm happy. Come, come Doesn't to get time you better than that. Right. Come to time to get those anchors off your shoulders as a boy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a good feeling. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you came to be with us today. I, the stated purpose was we were going to talk about uh, the KKK in this area. I went to the uh, Logan County Genealogical Society not too long ago, and there was a program given by Lynn Spellman okay. of Lincoln about uh, the Underground Railroad mm -hmm. and things. And it, it was just very, very interesting. Um, and it was the, the participants in the Underground Railroad in Toulon, just up above us here, Tad, um, were Roger Webster's mm. grandparents. Okay. Uh, so there was a local note on that, too. So I'm anxious to hear what you have to say about this. How robust was this outfit? Oh, the outfit in Logan County and in Atlanta and several of the other communities across the county was quite robust. Uh -huh. I think let's, let's back up one minute because there's a really common misperception about the KKK. And it, it stems from the fact that folks don't realize that historically there were three different iterations of the KKK. And they each that. focused on mm -hmm. something a little bit different. Okay? Yeah. Uh, the KKK uh, began initially after the end of the Civil War uh -huh. down in the South. <coughs> and it was specifically set up because whites in the area were very upset about the facts that blacks had been freed and they wanted to oppress them and not let them participate in politics or general society. And it was pretty much a southern-based organization right after the Civil War. <coughs> that iteration lasted until about... 1880s? 1880s, probably. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, the more interesting one that really impacts us in Atlanta and Logan County mm -hmm. is the KKK that was developed, oh, starting around 1915 to 1930. Mm -hmm. And it is fascinating because just stop and think a minute about all the changes that <coughs> happened from the period 1915 to 1930. If you were an adult living then, you would have been introduced to radio. Mm -hmm. You would have witnessed uh, the fact that the Russia turned into the Soviet Union. You would have witnessed the greatest influx of immigrants primarily from poor countries in Eastern Europe that the U.S. had ever seen. Mm -hmm. You would have witnessed prohibition mm -hmm. and you would have witnessed uh, women acting in ways that they never were allowed to act before. They smoked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, perish yes, the thought. <laughs> they smoked. What I'm trying to say is it was an era of really great change. upheaval yeah. and change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as a result of that, a lot of folks in the nation, especially in the North, wanted to resist that change. That got combined with a prejudice against Catholics and Jews mm -hmm. and blacks, mm -hmm. and it resulted in the KKK in the mid-1920s having approximately four to five million members That's in this something. country. Isn't that so? Huge. North and South alike. North and South alike, right. Started in Indiana. Actually, yes, the northern version started in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Of all the states in the north, Indiana had the highest population mm -hmm. of KKK members, and Illinois was not far behind. Mm -hmm. Now, the third iteration, that fizzled out with the coming of World War II. Mm -hmm. The third iteration is the one that we're very all familiar with, and it was a reaction to the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, mm -hmm. on in the beginning and the third iteration, those are pretty much anti-black organizations. Mm -hmm. No question. But that middle one added a whole lot of other elements to it. Anti-immigrant, 
anti uh, women's mm -hmm. uh, suffrage and emancipation, mm -hmm. anti prohibition, and anti black to a degree. They weren't anti-prohibition. Or not anti. Very, oh, yeah, I'm not anti-prohibition. They were very much in favor in of favor. making sure that moral, the laws of prohibition. Reform. Yes, moral reform it in general. Was their agenda. But you know the yeah. difference of the immigrants at that time, as opposed <laughs> to what we experience today. Those immigrants were seeking a new life and a better, and they came over not expecting a handout per se. Oh no, as, as we do mm -hmm. today, and. Uh, they, we had a bunch of them in Lincoln, Illinois, what we call the north north side of the tracks. Uh, they had a bad name for it, and I'm not going to do that. But uh, those folks, they came to work. Sure. They supported themselves. Yeah. Taxpayers didn't do that. Yeah. Interestingly, they were willing to take jobs that others wouldn't Menial. take. So Menial. that caused some problems. Yes. But that's a parallel to today. Yes, too. that is. Mm -hmm. That is. And many of them did come from Catholic countries. And here in the Midwest, especially, we're predominantly Protestant. Uh -huh. So there's that whole notion of we don't want the Pope running our government or us. There's a big outcry against, if you remember, Alfred Smith running for president. Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. First openly Catholic person mm -hmm. to right. run for president mm -hmm. in the United States. And that was a real issue mm -hmm. for a lot of folks. As it was with then. John Kennedy. Oh, yes. People said, oh, sure, they it vote for him. Itself. The Pope will be running uh -huh. the country, remember? Well, I'm just vaguely aware that there was in Lincoln, Illinois, a, quote, chapter, if that's the right word, of KKK, because I found out, Mother told me, that uh, uh, my father's business partner was a member, and it was a very, it was a real, real serious problem between them, and uh, because, and that began a, a problem that they uh, had forever. Because this guy was a member of the KKK, and uh, that was really, my father thought that was really pretty stupid and also very bad for business. And then, so you also then up here in Atlanta, you had a chapter. Oh, yes. Atlanta had its own chapter <clears throat> affiliated with the Logan County chapter. And I've just handed Bill and Judy something. It's kind of hard to read. Can you read it? Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, part of it. The top is, it, well, Logan it's, it's County. It's an embossed seal. It's an embossed uh -huh. seal. And it's uh, of the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan, this first word I... Of the Logan County chapter, and I believe it's 158, where in the, where of the Ku Klux with, Klan. Well, this is, is I'm holding that? in my hand the seal that made the yes. embossed seal that you're looking at. My, what a... And this is the actual seal press machine yeah. device, like you'd see in a notary public's sure, office, sure. Right. Uh, that was used by the Logan County chapter 158 of the KKK. So when you joined, did you get like a certificate of membership? I, I'm, sure. Was, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Probably. Yeah, I'm sure. Yes. Suspect. And yeah. this is one of the artifacts That's that we amazing. have in the museum. Fascinating. Came down evidently when we presented the program on the KKK up at the Palms Grill uh -huh, uh, a month uh -huh. or so ago. Uh, one of the first things we said was, we're not going to talk about family names. Yeah. We're just going to talk about information because a lot of people it's were very sensitive. interested in the program, and it's a sensitive issue. Yeah. So all I know for sure is um, this belonged to a family in Atlanta. Isn't that And we're assuming there was an affiliation there and sure. maybe even the secretary of the Logan County sure. chapter. Sure. Don't let sure. Antique Roadshow see that. No, <laughs> no. It's a pretty priceless it artifact. Um, Truly. That yeah. must have, have yeah. been, uh, the Ku Klux Klan must have been, an acceptable organization like joining any other fraternal oh, yeah. organization. It was like Rotary Club. Yeah, really. Or the Masonic Lodge. Yeah. Isn't In many ways it was mm -hmm. because so many people and so many prominent folks in many of the communities in the county were members. Oh, some of us would be shocked and ashamed to know that some of our ancestors were active. Yes. Not just paying members but we're active well but you shouldn't be shocked or ashamed because people did that and because we're not responsible for what our great grandparents did any more than they poor souls are responsible for what i do we, we've done a lot of I'm research about that trying <laughs> to figure out what the kkk in atlanta really was interested in uh -huh. and focused on uh -huh. and Anytime you look at history, it's like looking at a puzzle with a lot of pieces missing because you simply don't have all the information that you need to really see the truth, okay? Yeah. But what we, we are pretty confident of is 
it wasn't so much an organization in Atlanta that was anti-black as it was an organization that was really interested in upholding moral, conservative, white American Protestant values. Good old-fashioned. That's what it really focused on. Yeah, I was going to say, because in Atlanta, you had no, to speak of, you uh, in that time, how many black folks did you have up there? You want to go or you want to? Yes, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay. Well, this is one of the things we looked at, because we wanted to see if there was a relationship to the, between the number of black families in Uh Atlanta and the popularity of the KKK at any given time. Mm -hmm. So we've done the census research, and there was a steady rise in the number of blacks living in Atlanta from the Civil War up through about 1890. Okay, at Mm -hmm. one time, we had enough families in town to actually support an African Methodist Episcopal Church. My word. It Mm -hmm. melded into the one in Lincoln Mm -hmm. in the 1890s. Uh When they all left. <laughs> right. But the KKK didn't really become popular in Atlanta until like 1922 to 28. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. There were still black families living in town, and there were still black families living in town in the 30s and 40s mm-hmm. and after that. So we really don't think there was that There's not enough tie. data to support a correlation. It wasn't an anti-black right. black thing as no. far as KKKs in Atlanta at that time. No. And we know from articles in the Argus uh, a little bit about some of the activities that the KKK engaged in. And you'll see articles that talk about them walking into the Atlanta Christian Church on a Sunday morning in robes. In robes in the hood. Straight down to the end of the aisle, placing a bag of money on the altar and letting the minister know that we really appreciate the work that you and your church is doing to uphold morals, standards, and here's some money to help. Support you. Uh huh. That happened out at Eminence Christian Church. <coughs> it happened at the Presbyterian Church in Union. Mm-hmm. And those are the documented examples that we know of because we have those articles from the newspaper. That's fascinating. You Isn't know it? about that? You're, 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 uh, a, you're an Atlanta boy. Well, uh-huh. the other thing that's fascinating is picture <coughs> an August night in 1926 at the Atlanta Fairgrounds. Huge complex just south of town. Grandstand that would seat 4,000 people. Think of that. It's full because there's a huge KKK rally, including the women's auxiliary of the KKK and the junior KKK chapters. Big parade, floats, women's marching drills, band from Lincoln, people coming in from the train from Bloomington, Decatur, Peoria, Springfield. That's the point I was going to make. Now, yeah. they all had to come from, you didn't have all those here, so they came from surrounding right. communities. Mm-hmm. Now, right. think, think in terms of the transportation of the day uh-huh. at that time, and they show up here in, in huge numbers. Yeah. That's really interesting. And the big innovation at the 1926 rally out at the fairgrounds was as you came in, up to the gate to enter the fairgrounds, and you had to present your ticket that would have been mailed to you inviting you there because it was by invitation okay, that you got to come in and you presented the ticket, there was an electric cross at the gates. Not a fiery oh, one, an electric it? one. Uh-huh. It's 1926 and that's a new innovation. <laughs> now, there's, you there's know, you, we always associate Ku Klux Klan with violence, violence and mayhem. Uh, if you had that big a gathering in Atlanta, uh, that would have been a place where it could have happened. The Argus article specifically talks about <laughs> how well ordered and well organized the event was, and it was repeated again the next year, and then a year after that, it was actually part of the Atlanta Fair Week activities. There was a huge KKK rally and parade as one of the evenings of the fair. But no, no violence that was reported in the newspapers anyway. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper, I think the newspaper did a fairly neutral job of just reporting what what was going on. Well, that's kind of (laughs) unique. Newspaper (laughs) reporting a neutral job. uh, uh, Somebody will drop a stitch somewhere along the line (laughs) since then. Now, the only inkling of any violence that I've ever come across is based on oral history. Uh that I've heard. Uh And there's a pretty consistent set of two or three stories that when I've asked 
folks what they knew of the KKK that I hear about. And again, they support this notion that the KKK in Atlanta and Logan County was primarily interested in upholding moral standards. I hear a story about, oh, yeah, the KKK didn't bother the blacks in town, but if somebody was keeping his wife uh, barefoot in the kitchen and pregnant and abusing her, they would ride out and let him know what was what, and he better shape up. I also hear a story of, oh, there was a, a pretty rowdy bar down around uh, Lawndale, Lawndale, not far from where we're sitting right now, and it was not only liquor, it was dancing girls, oh, and the KKK <laughs> went down and <laughs> said, you need to clean up clean your, up your act, act, shut this down, or we'll take care of it. Isn't that interesting? So, yeah, it's, it's those. Now, I, I, I don't have a newspaper article. No, I don't no, even no. have a letter that anybody wrote that referenced that, mm -hmm. but we have oral. at least oral stories, stories. that... But don't that. you think that back in that era, mm -hmm. the newspaper uh, reported only the nice things? No, not at all. Oh, they, oh, oh no, because it's fascinating to read the stories of arguments between different civic organizations mm -hmm. or uh, arguments over this person is being tried unfairly. I mean, we could go on and on about those kinds of things. Judy. We're going to have an argument with our sponsors if we uh -oh. don't if we don't stop and give them a few minutes time we're going to come back and have rachel and bill thomas or uh, oops, sorry about that there um, i was a thomas once it's okay <laughs> <laughs> you were a thomas which was a good thing by the way all right back to here at live in the studios of WLCN 96.3 and the number is 648551. Uh, fascinating conversation with uh, Bill Thomas and his daughter Rachel. Um, the history of the KKK in around Atlanta, Illinois. Uh, as a 90 year old, I just remember talk about it when I was a younger man and uh, uh, things that my mother and so forth would say. Uh, but this is an entirely different type. You know, as soon as we think of KKK, you think of a bunch of hooded, ho hoodlums who were just simply anti-black, and that was that, and, and that's the kind of a general concept of the KKK. Uh, we're hearing an entirely different version of it here, uh, Judith K., in that the, the, the chapter here was made up of some, some substantial uh, citizens in the community, and it was more of a, a, a moral uh, police organization, if, I, if one of a better word, uh, I think that's a I really nice a really, way to yeah. capture it, yeah. Bill. Uh, so, yeah. uh, and, lo and behold, Mr. Thomas brought up a, 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 a two... I'm sorry we don't... Turn up your television sets a little bit, folks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But Bill Thomas brought up a, an actual robe of the Ku Klux Klan that uh, they have found in some, uh, in, uh, some materials here. Uh, yeah, the, we, Atlant the Atlanta Museum actually has a collection of five authentic KKK robes from the community. The one I'm holding in my hand would fit a man, and there are just a few distinguishing things about it. It's homemade. It was made out of a sugar sack, sack or, or a set mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. sugar sacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it has really nice stitching on it. It has a collar, nice buttons, long sleeves, and then we have um, two women's two robes and we actually have two children's outfits. Children's outfits that consisted of short pants uh -huh. and little jackets. What we don't have in the collection are hoods, but uh -huh. we do have these. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they didn't wear hoods since there wasn't the necessity to hide their... No, I, ha I, I have a story <laughs> on that. There's a, a delightful, again, an oral story that has pa been passed down uh, it was a secretive organization, and they did wear hoods, and they didn't go around saying if they were a member or not. Uh -huh. And the joke was, somebody confronted them once, a group of them in Atlanta, and said, well, why are you wearing those robes and those hoods? I mean, if we don't know the horse you're riding, we're going to recognize your boots. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, it's a small That's town. You all right, know exactly. each other. Absolutely, yeah. And each exactly. other's horse. No secrets sure. at all, really. Another story for you that I was just blown away when I learned about this. They didn't overtly 
say they were a member, but there was a very subtle means that they communicated membership, oh. and it was done primarily by those members who were businessmen. Up in Atlanta, on the corner of Arch and Vine Street, just down from the Bunyan statue, was a confectionery and small restaurant called the Wisteria Cafe. Okay? It was there in the mid-1920s. On the window and in the newspaper articles where they advertised, they had a slogan. Oh, we have cigars and confections, etc. But then their slogan was, come into our store because I believe they had rotating fans, a, a real innovation. And ice cream. And ice cream. Mm -hmm. And their slogan was, come keep cool. But it was oh, spelled K-K-K-K. -K -K -K. <laughs> and the more research we've done, we've discovered that was a very prompt, and we found lots of other examples mm -hmm. from Bloomington, elsewhere. That was the way a member would subtly communicate they that were they, in. Yeah. That you were Come welcome cool. if you were a yeah. fellow uh -huh. member. You know, it's very, very creative advertising. Yeah. Well, I thought he was going to say secret handshake because <laughs> that's what all the jokes are about. Now, you, you have not only this man's uniform but you have for the ladies that must mm -hmm. have been the auxiliary yes that there was you a referenced. women's auxiliary of the kkk when they held the big um rallies out at the fairground the women would put on precise military marching drills in formation that was just part of their contribution to the program their stick, their yeah. stick <laughs> yes yeah it's interesting you know as i said a minute ago when you think of KKK, your immediate thought is a bunch of thugs running around and, uh, and it was all anti-black, but that's not the case at all. As, as we're hearing the story unfold this morning, uh, this was kind of, a, in a way, a, a, a social organization, uh, but they had a goal. Yes. And the goal was that they're pretty much moral, morally upright and, and mm -hmm. forthright. And uh, so the, it wasn't an anti-black, per se, thing at all up here, was well, it? Well, not that we can find any documented uh -huh. evidence of, Bill. Probably uh, not anti-Jewish either, since did you have any Jewish Well, people? yes. Yes, we did, as a matter of fact, on oh. competing mm -hmm. corners. The building where my office is uh -huh. was Frankie Perlman's uh, dry mm -hmm. goods store, and across the street I, was I Cohen's remember that name. Mm -hmm. well, dry goods go. store. Yes. We had two Jewish mm -hmm. merchants in town. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I, I'd have to check the <coughs> dates to see if they were in business in the 20s or if that was later. They uh -huh. may have just been starting out in the late 20s, uh -huh. but we did have the families in town. I find it intriguing that your daughter Rachel has uh, gotten as interested in this as Adele, and she's able to kind of tip in and, and help Dad with a memory or two because she, she's obviously done a lot of research this on herself. Now, and, you know, one of the things we're going to have Rachel with us this morning is talk about this wonderful library, which is a gym in in Atlanta. And and, currently and, boarded up. And, 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 and well, yes, <laughs> but, yeah. Well, that's temporary. That's temporary. Uh, that must, yeah. you know, they're reworking that beautiful octagon building mm -hmm. up there. Uh, one of the and I, I have to confess, in front of God and everybody, I've never set foot through the front doors, and I've always been one of the things I was just. I got to do that as soon as you get it back open. <laughs> but uh, let's, I really don't want to shift away from this KKK thing because it's so interesting and intriguing. But Judy and I have a great affinity for these smaller communities that surround Lincoln uh, and what goes on there because uh, they're the lifeblood of Logan County. It's mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a peripheral way, for, uh, uh, Lincoln is a hub. And uh, we haven't talked much about, uh, as much about the line as we should. Uh, especially since it's Jim's hometown, and he has the key on the switch, he can turn us off anytime he wants. <laughs> <laughs> he be but, the man. <laughs> um, this is an architectural gym up here, and it's a wonderful thing yes. for the community. So let's address that. You're now having a major renovation plan. Yes, a uh, huge renovation. We're redoing top to bottom. They redid the roof this mm -hmm. past summer, um, and we ripped apart the basement. Uh, in the fall and this winter we're now focusing on the main floor all the reading rooms and uh, circulation room on the main floor <clears throat> we're turning the basement into a new children's library yeah. it was completely gutted and redone all new bookshelves built down there it'll mm -hmm. be carpeted a uh, small kitchen has been put in so it will really become a much more usable space than it's been in the past kind of like a meeting room for people uh, it, to them it, 
it may have room for a meeting room, but mm -hmm. it's more primarily focusing on children's activities. So we Which have plenty of room to, to do that. Here. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, and this is a personal observation, Judith Kay. Okay. Uh, I presume that children do not use the libraries like they did when I was a kid. When I made, I used to make treks down to the Lincoln Public Library on a regular basis all the time, and it was just a really, and unfortunately things being what they are, things changing, and television and having a terrible impact on kids and so forth. I wonder how many kids are reading today. Well, I'm sure plenty of kids are reading. It's whether or not they're checking li books out from the library. And really, I could say the same about adults. We don't have a lot of adults coming into the library either. The whole face of tech, not libraries in general, are changing. And um, hopefully my involvement and uh, Kathy, the other program director at the library, we're really working um, and trying to d figure out what our direction is going to be in the future and how to cater more to a technological age. Yes. So. And we've already taken some steps. Mm -hmm. um, if you had walked into the library two years ago or even a year and a half ago to check out a book, you still would have pulled a card out yeah. of the front of the book and mm -hmm. taken a pencil and your due date would have been written. And I love that. I yeah. love that kind of tradition and yeah. that experience. Yeah. You and I both. But now it's all digitized oh, sure. and mm -hmm. so we can track and we can send you. I love it because I get notices, oh, my book is due in two days. So that's a nice reminder, an email that I receive. We have ebook capabilities now so people can bring in their nooks and their Kindles and download books. But that's the, another big item. Oh, it's a huge <laughs> item. Mm -hmm. And, Bill, you hit it on the head. Libraries simply aren't what they used to be. And if we're going to be relevant, we have to keep up with the times. Uh -huh. So that's why Kathy and Rachel and the library board has really focused the last couple of years on an expansion of our community-wide programming. And we're doing a tremendous amount of programming up there now for adults mm -hmm. and for kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why we wanted a nicer space in the basement, especially for children, so we could keep expanding. Mm -hmm. We're doing art programs and theater programs yeah. and writing workshops and ceramics and adult reading groups. It's just a really busy schedule now. I, I seem to recall articles about uh, those activities from last summer. Right. And I assume you'll mm -hmm. be having a big program again this summer. Yes. Uh, it'll probably be divided into two sections, one in June and one at the beginning of August uh, due to availability. Can't of, you stand the kids on a <laughs> continual <laughs> basis? No. <laughs> <laughs> Even I have my limits. No. <laughs> no, actually, this is um, the first summer that I will be involved in those programs. I've only been on staff since uh, last August, really. So um, this is my first exper experience planning and being going to be able to work with those kids. Does the Atlanta Library have anything to do with folks who are sight impaired? For instance, Jean uh, um, is sight impaired and uh, legally blind now, but she gets books, little tapes from the uh, Illinois mm -hmm. Blind Association or whatever it is, and she's, quote, read yes. more books in the last uh -huh. year than she read in 10 years, really, mm -hmm. because it's a very simple thing for her, if the, those folks who have that problem, to put these little tapes on right. and, and uh, turn them off whenever you want to or back up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything like that up I there? Say, and uh, actually, recently, we just went through that collection that we have. We had uh, cassettes and CDs, yes. and now uh -huh. we mostly just um, have condensed that down to CDs, just due to technology and right. what people have access to. You know, you don't see a lot of... We also have layers. a fairly large collection of large print books, in addition to books on tapes. And that's something that's necessary now. Yes, a lot of folks appreciate now. that. I yeah. just discovered yeah. that. I'm going through uh, <laughs> Doris Gerns, uh, Gerns Goodwin book on the bully pulpit. Yes. Uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a great writer. She uh, can really organize her notes and so forth and put it together in a very cogent way. But uh, I found that the font size was a little small. It's a 700 and some page book. Right. And oh. I'm waiting my way through it. And uh, it's kind of slow going because, just, uh, because of my eyes. Well, we're going to send a personal invitation to you and Jean and Judy to come to the open house that we'll have once the library's renovation project We'd is like done. That. Because hopefully you're going, by April. yeah, hopefully by April, you're going to be amazed. Upstairs, 
we have done, I think, a really good job of taking the library back to the way it looked in 1908 when it first opened. So we preserve that historic character and you're going to be able to walk in now and enjoy that architecture but also have access to what we hope is the most up-to-date technology that we can offer. At one point, uh, when, when I was at the library, it had the uh, museum in the basement, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now the museum is right. totally over next right. to the Palms Grill. On the and, main floor. <laughs> uh, main floor and upstairs, and mm -hmm. we have an elevator. So. Mm -hmm. so there's no excuse. No excuse. And you no have excuse. people who are uh, manning uh, the place, so to speak, docents and so forth, that uh, Rachel becomes a part of that. That group. is my primary job is to um, uh -huh. provide programming that comes from the museum, keep the exhibits updated, uh, bring in new items, inventory and catalog, all the new artifacts that we get donated, mm -hmm. and just general do we have that noted on the uh, uh, tourism board or so that uh, buses and so forth can stop and, and take a look at that? Really? Oh, that's that's uh -huh. a good point. Uh, oh, yes. And I do a lot of that coordinating uh -huh. with, with bus Great. tours. And Rachel coordinates. Rachel solicits uh, and gets volunteers from town to mm -hmm. act as our docents at the museum mm -hmm. during the day. Right. And Great. then she works so with that them. I can, yeah. uh -huh. You know, the older you come, the more, the more interesting history is. Um, I wish I'd have, I was a fair student of history, you know, I didn't get A pluses, but I got good grades in history. But I, as I've gotten older, I'd have gotten 100% most of the time because uh, it's really fascinating. It is, uh, it is. And the thing mm -hmm. that, the approach that we're trying to take in Atlanta through the museum and all the programming we do and the exhibits we design, um, history at its best, in my opinion, simply tells the story of a place and a group of people. And that's what we're all about. That's why we wanted to put together the KKK program, uh -huh. because that's a relatively unknown chapter sure in the story is. of Atlanta, and right. we wanted folks to know about that. Now, the, the KKK right here was kind of almost post um, Underground Railroad then? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because they weren't doing that It anymore. was at its peak in the mid-1920s. Yeah, and that's way after. And if you want to see one photograph that captures the how prevalent and huge the KKK was in America in the 1920s, <laughs> Google KKK 1920s March on DC. Oh. And you will see a photograph of row after row after row of white-robed KKK members in formation with the United States Capitol in the back of them marching down the street in the nation's capital. And you want to bear in mind that not all these were just thugs and... Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh no, not, again, yeah. it was the height of that. Uh -huh. We need to preserve the morals Very of our time uh, and promote Americanism. Well, because may that's some the first group thing you like think that about rise it. again. <laughs> I, was, I was at the... When we gave the program um, afterwards talking to people, I think that a lot of those in the room would have gladly joined an organization as such today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, th that flavor uh, permeates at different levels because we d we do get a little worried about what happened to this business about your your handshake being your bond and so forth. You know, we've got to shape up a little bit here. Right. And speaking of shaping up, the clock has shaped us up again, unfortunately. Uh, we've appreciated very much to having uh, Rachel and Bill Thomas with us today. Fascinating history, and uh, uh, I repeat myself, uh, as I want to do, I first knew uh, Mr. Thomas many years back when I had grandchildren in his school, and he was a school administrator, and uh, I was always thankful my kids went to that school because that's how I got to meet uh, Bill Taylor. Yeah. You know, so, uh, moving force up here in Atlanta, and uh, obviously he is... Uh, indoctrinated his daughter Rachel with the same enthusiasm. We appreciate that very, very much. Learned at uh, your father's knee. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have a political quote again as we close because this is a season, open season on them. And a uh, fellow says, uh, politicians are people who, when they see the light at the end of the tunnel, go out and buy more tunnel. <laughs> 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 well, 
right with some of these dudes we've got down here <laughs> from Springfield, Washington, wherever you are. Thank you very much, Rachel and Bill. Thank you. All right. Thank you.